Hi, this is Nayetta, and you're listening to The Health Show. To The Health Show. And you're listening to The Health Show. And you're listening to The Health Show. The Health Show is a podcast dedicated to connecting individuals to mental health resources in the community. The Health Show is more than a podcast, it's a movement focused on change. Our objectives are to change the perception and visible stigma associated with mental health, remove barriers to mental health resources, address the needs of the underserved and the challenges they face when attempting access mental health resources, spread awareness on how to access mental health resources in the community, and encourage those with mental health diseases to seek help. One person, this guy told me, which is so true, you don't know what you don't know. And I think that all of us, not all of us, but a lot of people, they assume. Instead of saying, I don't know what I don't know. Exactly. You know, and so that's why I have yourself and your wife on here to kind of really break down. Dr. Roger, you guys to truly break down, you know, um, to break down the who, what, when, where, and how, how to get uh, assistance, where to get assistance, when to, how to identify, you know, you know, things are important. I have your, I have you guys book here. I'm trying to see who's on this line first, cause this who might be. Let me, let me make a career. Do you know? Do you know Danita Jones? No. Okay, cause I might give Danita this book. I might. Okay. So she was first. She was the first person on here. You know, I, I like surprises, cause um, Dr. Lee actually signed the book. This is a, so Danita, um, I am before the podcast is over with. Please, who is over here? Please um, send me. <laughs> I am. Um, I was reading something. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to send you a book called Mind Matters since you were on first. This is a really good book. It's a resource guide to psychiatry to black communities. And it breaks down pretty much um, mental health in the black communities. But kind of like um, if you heard the DSM 5. It breaks those some of those diagnoses down really simple, and then you know ways to eat, um, what to look for, what causes depression, what affects depression, um, uh, what is it? How can some people drink and use drugs and never become addicted? Like things of that nature, like things that we face in the black community. So, am I saying her name, Danita? D e n i t a? Does that sound? Yeah, I think I'm saying it right. It's Jones. What I'm before this podcast is over with, please. Um, I'm going to give you my email address if you could write this down. Email me your your address, and I'm going to send you this book. This is an absolutely great book, and it's actually signed um, by the author. And actually, one of the the author, um, Dr. Otis um, Anderson, is one of the authors on on here as well. So um, this book is yours. So if you can email me at info at dthehelpshow.org and say, hey, this is my address. My name is Danita Jones. I won my book for being first. I got you. <laughs> Let me see. Miss Jones. Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Jones. I'm letting her talk. Hold on. All right, I'm here. Okay. So, uh, did you get the information I just told you? Um, I just needed the email info at death penalty. Yeah, the help show dot org. Okay, the help show. Yes. This is a really great book. I've read it. I think you're going to enjoy it immensely and learn a lot from it. And it's a, it's real easy read, real easy, real easy. But you'll learn a lot. A lot of different diagnoses, things you may have known, things you didn't know. But this is a really, really great guide for mental health for the black community. So I just want to say thank you for being first. And thank I can't you so much. Yeah, and I can't wait to see this book. I can't wait. This is awesome. I'm actually I'm tuning in not only I'm tuning in with my kids as well, but I'm also tuning in because I'm reporting back 
to a Facebook group that my friend and I started. Um, it's called Lake Highland Area Moms Against Racism. Okay, awesome. And so we're trying to um, get our white friends, allies, to understand how some of the trauma from past generations still affect us and haunt us now. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So. Yay. So we're, I'm really excited <laughs> that <laughs> we have joined. Let me see, is everybody on here? Let me see. I'm going to put you back on mute. Okay. Whatever questions that you do have, prepare them because we are going to answer all of them. We're going to have Dr. Rogers. Okay. We're going to have Dr. Um, Angela Anderson. Also, we're going to have Dr. Um, Otis Anderson to answer your questions. So whatever questions you have, write them down. And at the end, um, we'll answer everything that you want to know. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. First of all, I want to thank everybody for being here this, this evening. So we have our first guest. We're our first host, our co-host, Dr. Kenneth Rogers. Um, he is an adult child adolescent psychiatrist. This South Carolina native has passion for helping individuals and families achieve sense of peace and happiness. He and his wife, Vernal Rogers, started Abundant Life Service LLC to provide marriage and family seminars as well as office-based care. Currently, Dr. Rogers is a professor of psychiatry at UT Southwestern Medical Center and chief psychiatry at Parkland Hospital. Recently, Dr. Rogers joined the Southern Area Behavior Healthcare to provide care in the Southern Dallas County. Dr. Rogers received his MD and residency training at the University of South Carolina. Additionally, he holds degrees in public health management from UCLA and the University of Southern Carolina. Woo hoo, Dr. Rogers. <laughs> um, we have Dr. Angela Anderson. She is the number one uh, Amazon international best-selling author of Now What? I Get Over Yourself and Move. Dr. Anderson is a leadership and organizational expert. She's the owner of Dr. Angela Speaks. If you guys want to check that out, that's www.drangelaspeaks.com. The company mission is to guide individual organizations on the journey to maximizing their full potential the solution focus, actions, and positive mindset. Additionally, Dr. Anderson is an international certified by the John C. Maxwell team as an executive advisor, master speaker, and trainer. This group specializes in providing training around the world on topics such as leadership, influence, motivation, team dynamics, and much more. Dr. Anderson trains groups with the business, educational, nonprofit, healthcare fields, the goal is to empower others to improve, increase productivity, operate at maximum potential. Um, I think I lost. Okay, Dr. Anderson graduated from Dillon University in New Orleans, LA, with a Bachelor of Arts degree in clinical psychology. She received a master's degree in clinical psychology from the University of Northern Ohio in Cedar Falls. Dr. Anderson completed her doctoral work in management organization leadership from the University of Phoenix, Arizona. She is also a member of the National Association of Professional Women in Delta Sigma, Theta Sorority. Dr. Anderson enjoys traveling, reading, helping others maximize their potential. Dr. Anderson continues to demonstrate inmate ability to encourage, inspire, and lead. We last but not least, Dr. Otis Anderson. Dr. Otis Anderson III is a community psychiatrist practicing in the state of Mississippi. He plans to soon return to practice in his home state of Tennessee. He is formerly the lead psychi psychiatric administrator for Mississippi Behavioral Health Services, which serves the rural Medicaid population in eight towns in Mississippi. He is a funding member, is a founding member of Global Health Psychiatry, group of black psychiatrists, and collectively published in best-selling book mind matters a resource guide psychiatry for black communities oh this book right here that i'm giving away to mrs jones <laughs> um he served as the medical director of the chemical dependency of unitree lakes hospital in bassville mississippi and ge um, geriatric care units of north oak regional hospital 
Dr. Anderson served as staff psychiatrist at Allen's Healthcare and Hospital in Holy Springs. I am so honored to have these panelists, guests, and um, co-hosts today. So I am ready to get this thing started. We're doing this, we're doing trauma, um, inter intergenerational trauma. We're not like police ba um, bashing. And also we are not, um, we're, we're moving with everybody. Black lives do matter. I have to put that out there, but also we want every, want everybody to know that everybody deals with trauma. And so we, at the, here at the Help Show, we want, every, we want to help everybody. We're going to talk about what is trauma, um, tips on ways to manage impacts of trauma, and understanding bias, and then the Q&A. Um, also, one more thing before we actually start the podcast, we do have a questionnaire at the end of the podcast. Please answer the questionnaire. What that allows us to do at the Help Show, that helps us get funded. We are a nonprofit. So you answer those questions, people answer questions, and then when it's time for us to get funded, it helps us with our funding. So just putting it out there, when, when you guys get the question, this, um, the, um, the survey is super short because I don't like surveys either. We are going to do a poll. Like, are we going to start off with a poll? And the poll question is, have you or anyone you know had a traumatic experience? So let me put this poll question up. So have you or anyone you know had a traumatic experience of multiple, um, of experience? Um, well, have you or anyone you know had any traumatic experience? Trauma is any stressful event that has a direct impact on your mood or behavior um, in the future. You know, it can be described as intense fear, whether it's a deep fear of threat to your life or, or a loved one around you. Um, it also can be described as a generational event that can directly affect your mood and behavior as well. So it's important for you to understand that it doesn't necessarily have to directly impact you. It can directly, it can impact, you know, those around you just as well. And when it comes to intergenerational trauma, can you explain that, um, Dr. O, a little bit for us? Well, the intergenerational trauma, uh, what you see may be how it affected your ability to generate wealth. So, we, you know, everybody's talking about redlining now, or we can talk about the 90-day anniversary of uh, Black Wall Street. Dr. Angela, what, like, what's your thoughts on that? So, you know, there's so many ways that we've been impacted. You know, to Dr. O's point, you don't necessarily have to have something that happens directly to you to be impacted by the trauma of that event. Um, I'll give you a personal example. There are people who've experienced uh, negative encounters with the police in my own family. Now, that hasn't happened to me, but it's happened to people close to me, which impacts the way I interact with law enforcement. Yeah. And you don't have to go back as far as slavery. That's yeah. part of it. And those are, you know, of course, severe traumas that have happened for multiple generations. But it can be something that happened last week to somebody that you care about that impacts you today. So I think it's important that we have a discussion around the full spectrum of how trauma can manifest, um, not just to us directly, but indirectly as well. Okay, I don't know if you, if you saw it. A little black boy, he was playing basketball. The police drove by mm -hmm. and he got the basketball and hid behind the car. Yeah. Like I used that example in the talk this week. And that's not something that anybody told him to do, you understand. That is just a response to what he has seen or what he has experienced. Absolutely. Dr. Rogers, I have a question for you. When young boys decide to say, hey, I see the police, I'm going to hide behind a vehicle because that is, is it that they think that's the right thing to do? I'm going to take things a little, little bit different direction. So I think there's the trauma that's associated with police um, that, you know, is related to the stuff that we see on the news. But I think the other piece is when we're talking about intergenerational trauma is the traumas that we don't know exist within our families that manifest themselves in all kinds of ways. Sometimes to make us paranoid of things that we have no clue why we're paranoid of them. Right. For example, I think about the number of times that I've started work in therapy with a kid, and 
the kid's anxious, the kid's uptight, the kid's hyperactive. And initially I'm wondering, is this kid, does this kid have an anxiety disorder? Does this kid have ADHD? What's going on? And then I'm watching the parental, usually mother interaction with the child. And what I'm frequently seeing is a mother that almost appears to be overbearing in some ways. And I'm sitting there looking at it and it looks maladaptive until usually a year down the road when they trust me a lot more than they did on the front end. And I start to find out about mom's traumas that have happened over and over and over and over again. And she's now trying to protect her child. So sometimes I think the thing that we see as being afraid of the police has to do with the things that we've seen on TV. Sometimes seeing the police triggers for the family incidents that have happened in the family. So besides they can't protect their kids, what, what is another impact of trauma that we you know, encounter? Well, you know, I think about, I've done a lot of my own therapy work, as you, you and I have I've talked about in the past. And one of the things that I've looked at is my own relationship with my father. Had a great father, great dad. But my father grew up in rural South Carolina. He was born in 1925, was a World War II vet in Nazi Germany. There were things that my father would never talk about but I can see the triggers that would happen with this mild-mannered guy that never let anything ruffle him, but he would start watching something on TV about Adolf Hitler and freak out. Um, we would look at things that looked at Klan rallies on TV, and he would get up and walk in the other room. I never knew exactly what the things were that he saw because he was never going to tell me. Men of that generation didn't talk about those traumas. Right. But I clearly knew that there was something that was making this man that I adored and I love and that I looked up to feel very, very uncomfortable. And so I knew that I, there were certain things I needed to be uncomfortable of just because I'm seeing those same things happen in front of me. Let me give you another example. And you're talking about a direct trigger let me give an example of an indirect trigger. Uh, my dad was born in 45, and so therefore he was a Vietnam War vet. Uh -huh. And although his job description when he was in Vietnam was he actually was a medic and worked in the hospital. Yeah. yeah. But as a black medic, although he was actively involved in the surgeries, he also, as a black man, was forced to clean up the operation rooms as well. And so, therefore, his level of trigger was walking in the hospital. And understand that, you know, the indirect trigger was as I was moving into my home and I was moving a couch into the home, one of the couches had on a label made in Vietnam. And you instantly saw him get startled, okay. start sweating, and get anxious. You have to understand, my father, you know, 33 and a half years, he was a policeman. When you're talking about him, you're envisioning a tough guy. He was my Superman. But to see him re respond to that kryptonite in that moment, that kryptonite of direct trauma, in that moment, you saw helplessness. Hmm. Yep. And so I had to quickly hide the box just so he would come in. And then I heard his mouth after the fact. We fought this darn war just so you could get some furniture. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean I understood in, in that moment I understood and you know talking with Dr. Angela you know the birth of our children he dreaded coming into the hospital like literally I had to make him take a drink just so he would walk in the hospital for the birth of his grandchildren he was that afraid because he said even though there was nothing in there around it he could viscerally smell blood in the air and it's real, you know. You have to think about how trauma is uncovered with your protective factors. For him, his protective factor was he was a policeman. He was always working. And so as it got towards the retirement age, I started to see those layers of protection being peeled off. And I could recognize it. I was well into 
a psychiatry resident, but I was able to recognize it as a child and, and, and young adult. You can see those layers of protection, you know, being unmasked. You can see them being peeled off. So I, I want to I wanna kind of dig into that to, for the next um, slide about racial discrimination. And so I pulled this slide up and it was saying the statistics <clears throat> with racial discrimination is 76% of African and Asian American ex experience racism. So I'm just thinking, this is, 20, this is 2019 statistic. Your father, Dr. Rogers, you said 1926, Dr. Rogers, and your father, 1945? Just imagine, it's probably extremely higher than that. Then, if you look at the 58%, Hispanic Americans experienced racism in 2019. 67% of whites never experienced racism in their whole life. So what Dr. Rogers' father went through with trauma and racism and discrimination, same thing with your father, you know, having to clean the blood up in the hospitals, the trauma that he went through, all this, is discrimination and I, I pulled this I pulled this slide in particular because things have not really changed. I want to do another poll. I, I kind of want to go more into this. So I found this on dgmslaw.com. And what, what's going on is that America still has a problem with discrimination in the workplace. And so in the current state of race relations and racial inequality in the United States, Americans cross racial ethnic groups also see race and the ethnicity playing a different in their personal lives. So I'm going to go into this poll and then we're going to kind of break down the trauma passed down through the generations with the discrimination. Poll question two, do you or anyone you know have ancestors that you know personally um, whose traumatic experience impact their future? Yeah. 81% that says yes and then 29% um, that says no. So my, my uncle passed, okay, he was 75 when he passed. He just passed on the 19th um, June 19th. And I would ask him things of this nature, like, do you, have you been discriminated against? Have you ever felt racism? My uncle picked cotton. And I, I, I say this because what happens is as a people, we become immune. It's like normal. So you can't identify what's racism or what's discrimination if it's normalcy in your life. The trauma passed down through the generation. I say this because it was normal. He never said, I love you. He never showed expressions he never he never did those things because my father told me he was so traumatized about the things that were happening in the in the field where he was picking cotton it just became normal it was enormously for him like what was going on was very normal and so angela i kind of want I, I i would like for you to explain trauma that is passed down through the generations what does it look like how does it affect us how is it passed down how can we make it stop being passed down so, I'll, I'll tell you a story and it's actually about a person that's in my life as a child who was very influential for me uh, my first neighbor that i can remember as a child lived across the street from my family and she was a teacher and so I would go across the street and we would go over phonics and she would just spend this, you know, one-on-one -on -one time teaching me different things. I spent a lot of time talking to her, sharing with her. I, it wasn't until I was an adult that I learned that she was one of the freedom riders. She never discussed it. And when she got to a point to where she was willing to discuss it, she's 80 years old now. Um, I asked her, I said, why did you go for so many years without discussing you know, what happened? And she said for years, she had vowed that she would never return to the state of Mississippi. It wasn't until her granddaughter was going to college and she wanted her to come with her, which was in Florida. And so she had to go through the state. For her granddaughter, she was willing to do it. But she talked about being terrified the entire time they were driving through the state. Why? Because she was one of the freedom riders that was involved in the bus bombing. In Mississippi. As a matter of fact, she was supposed to be on the bus that was bombed and someone asked to change seats with her so they could sit with a friend. And so she got on the other bus. And so she was there and she saw the bus that she was going to be on bombed right in front of her eyes. So she talked about seeing people um, injured, you know, on fire, uh, being abused during that time because and she was reliving it as she was talking about it. And she said, the only way I knew to get through the years and raise my children was to not talk about it, to just pack it away, to admit that it was part of my history, but I couldn't go there. And so I think that's what we see a lot of times, particularly in generations who have come before us, 
there was just no space created for them to be able to talk about their experiences. That tendency to just be conditioned to carry on is something that has been passed down through multiple generations. When she spoke about this, the Freedom Rider, I mean, seeing bodies, probably dismantled in front of her, on fire. I know you probably could see her being afraid. She was right back there. Like when she described it, it was like she was reliving it all over again. It didn't matter that several years had passed. You have to keep in mind when this happened to her, she was a college student. She was young. She was doing what she thought was right for society. She was standing up for her rights. She was you know, exercising her voice and to have to witness that level of trauma so early and still navigate through your life in a way um, where you can have a family yourself, where you can have a spouse, where you can just really go day to day when she that that's the reason like I'm, I'm convinced of that, that she never talked about it, because when she did, she was back there. OK, on the story that she has um, told us, um, Dr. O, what I'm looking at is intergenerational trauma pattern. Do you think she brought it on to her granddaughter as far as her behavior, her pattern? I'm going to give you an example. And I mentioned that the fact that my dad worked as a medic, but he was treated like a janitor. If you were had the pay grade of a medic in the Vietnam War, the opportunities for you to go to, you know, advanced fields in medicine were much higher. My dad later told me that he wanted to go to medical school. He's valedictorian of his little country class, but he was so proud in saying that he was the doctor maker. Hmm. And I asked him, you know, even in growing up, even before I decided to go to medical school, I was like, Dad, don't you want us to be a policeman like you are? He was like, no. Yeah. He said, I want you to go and be something that's going to maximize your potential because your potential to change lives will be greater than mine as a policeman. He said, I don't want you to go somewhere where you're allowed to go. Go somewhere where you break barriers to go. Because he couldn't do it himself. And that is how discrimination for one generation can impact generational wealth generations after that. His rejection catapulted me into more of an internal motivation to be greater. Because so, we stand on the shoulders. Right. How does that put down to your family? How has that changed your family? You and Mrs. Anderson, do you tell your kids to read a chapter a, chapter a day? Do you instill those same values that your father instilled in you we teach our kids don't just learn what they tell you because then your level of education is going to be closed off i think for us the main thing with our girls is that we want them to to think right and we want them to be able to express what they've learned i think that's a, a key difference just between our upbringing and, and theirs you know we grew up with the with the thing that kids should be seen and not heard that you should study you know, if you have a question, that's fine, but it had to be asked in a certain way. We actually engage our daughters in dialogue, even at the ages that they are, because we want them to be comfortable using their voices, right? Still with, in a respectful way, but we want to make sure that they are thinkers, Absolutely. that they are processing information, and that they ask questions. And don't just, you know, receive information as it's given to you. But if you have further questions, ask. You know, I, I, I was I was listening to Otis and Angela and kind of processing their, their experiences, Angela with her neighbor and Otis with his dad. And I started thinking about my own family. And I think that my family is probably the prototype for your typical Southern family. Julius Rogers was born in slavery. Julius was a gift given to a slave master to his son. Then Julius had Tyler. Tyler was basically living during Reconstruction, died in the, in, the, in the 20s. My father, of course, 25, World War II vet. Then my dad growing up in, in rural, rural South as well. If you look at my family, the way that things are going to get interpreted is going to be different than a colleague of mine or a friend of mine who's never had a similar life experience. And so there's almost this compounding of trauma that happens because there's been so much trauma and so many adverse life experiences that have happened within the family that it almost gets interpreted as this is just one more thing that's happening to our family. And what I think the, the big emphasis for me has been is what kind of impact does that now have on our health? So if you look at the diseases that affect us, I mean, as African-Americans, you know, diabetes, hypertension, cancers, et cetera, 
a lot of it's tied to behaviors that really stem from traumas that we haven't really had a chance to process, deal with, and know where to go with it. And so if I think about the level of trauma that those guys and their wives all endured just to get to where I am, looking at what's going on now doesn't get processed in a vacuum. It's a trauma that gets compounded in all kinds of ways that even I can't fully see as a, as a trained psychiatrist. Helpline, seek help when needed. If distress impacts activities of your daily life for several days or weeks, talk to your clergy member, counselor, or doctor, or contact SAMHSA helpline at 1-800-985-5990. The crisis worker will work to ensure that you feel safe and help identify options and information about mental health services in your area. Your call is confidential and free. Crisis text line, text NAMI to 741-741. Connect with the trained crisis counselor to receive free 24-7 crisis support via text message. This podcast is produced by Nyetta Reynolds, Ben Fenton, Nicole Smith, and Davian Abney. To get your very own beats, email Davian Abney Music at gmail.com. The Help Show is a nonprofit organization. To learn more or donate, please visit www.thehelpshow.org. Or you can also cash app money sign the help show to send your donation. There is no donation too small. Every dollar we receive will strengthen our efforts. If you'd like to donate 1500 or more and become a VIP sponsor, visit www.thehelpshow.org to review additional packages with more detail. That's www.thehelp. S H O W dot org. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at The Help Show. Remember to subscribe to the podcast. Please leave comments. We want to know what you think. Thank you for listening and please stay tuned.